Hello, my name is Tim Turnus, and I am the Director of Programming and the St. John's Bible at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, more commonly known as Himmel. Himmel is located on the St. John's Abbey and University campus in Collegeville, Minnesota. Like many of you, I still find myself working from home these days due to COVID-19. And since I can't continue my programming around the country, I decided to put together a series of mini programs to share with you via Himmel at Home. Ancient Methods, Modern Results is a series of short talks which take a look at the historical roots of the tools, methods, and materials used in the making of the St. John's Bible. And today's topic is inks. If you're unfamiliar with the St. John's Bible, you can visit our website listed on the screen in front of you. The St. John's Bible is a monumental work of art. It's a handwritten Bible that was commissioned by St. John's Abbey and University as a way to mark the millennium. The project was started in 1995 and finished in 2011. It is the collective work of 23 artists and scribes under the direction of Donald Jackson, one of the foremost calligraphic artists in the Western world. The Bible was done using the most traditional of tools, methods, and materials. It was written on parchment. It was written with hand cut quills and employs beautifully ground handmade inks. In fact, any medieval scribe coming to life today would recognize every single tool and material used in the making of the St. John's Bible. Scribes have used handmade inks for centuries. And there are many, num many recipes from the Middle Ages that survive today. And they used a variety of materials, but they ended up falling into two kind of general categories. One, carbon-based ink, in which the black comes from the carbon, and two, metal gall ink, in which the black comes from a chemical reaction. Now, carbon was used very widely up until the 12th century, but it was probably not the only method that was used at the time. Most likely, gall inks were used as well, but not written about so, so widely. So let's explore a little bit the first type, or the, the gall type of inks. Now, oak galls grow on the branch of an oak tree, and they're rich in tannins, and, uh, which gives it the color. Now, galls grow when a wasp lays its eggs on the growing bud of a tree, and then a soft apple-like sphere starts to grow around the larva. Uh, when they're mature, the wasp bores its way out of the, the gall, leaving the dried gall nut behind. You can see here a little bit of a bore hole left over. Now, that nut is very rich in tannic and gallic acids. And the recipes, many of the recipes, or in fact, most of them from the Middle Ages, say the first step is to crush all those gall nuts, and then you want to soak them in rainwater or sometimes vinegar for several days or in the sun or near a fire. One old recipe from the Middle Ages says you can speed up the process by boiling the crushed gall nuts in water for as long as it takes to say the Our Father three times. Other recipes say you should soak them in the finest quality beverage you can afford or can find. So whatever it is, you're going to come up with this very gall-like or this very dark brownish water because you take those boiled nuts or those soaked nuts and you strain the water, strain those off and you end up with the brown water. And you now then need to add the second ingredient, which almost every medieval recipe calls for, and that is iron sulfate or ferrous sulfate, copperous it was also called. You can get that today by evaporating water from that type of earth, but a common method in the Middle Ages was to soak rusty nails. You would soak rusty nails in vinegar again or in a good quality beverage, and you would let it sit for days and you get this very um, dark uh, brown water. I'm sure you've all seen rusty water before, and that's what you want, and that's going to be very rich in iron. And you sometimes would filter it with alcohol as well, <clears throat> and then you take that and you add it to that initial mixture of the of that, of that solution. So you have the, ta the tannin-rich oak gall solution on the left here, and you slowly add the iron sulfate mixture, and it turns almost immediately black with a chemical reaction and you end up with this very black water. Now that's of course not thick enough to write with. A quill pen needs something with a good viscosity to allow it to flow down, not just run down the pen. So you thicken that with gum arabic. Now gum arabic is dried sap. 
And you would take that dried sap and you would boil it again to, to reliquify it and you add it to that brown or that black liquid and you get the most perfect thickness for writing with a pen. And you can see here is a manuscript from our collection written with gall ink from the, from the 19th century. And one of the problems with gall ink is that over time, it tends to turn brown. And depending upon the storage conditions, depending upon how much of the ink is actually on the page, and actually depending upon what the page is, another problem with iron gall inks is think of the recipe. They are rich in acids. Over time, they can cause some damage. You can see the words are eating the page right here as we go through. Well, when we made the St. John's Bible, we did not want to have that happen over time because we're going for a 2000 year history with the St. John's Bible. So we, we went to the other type of ink more commonly used in the Middle Ages, and that's carbon-based ink. Now the carbon-based ink for the St. John's Bible comes from very old um, ink sticks made in China. This is a picture of a contemporary ink. It's probably about four inches long. And the carbon or the blackness comes from the carbon. And the most common source from carbon in the Middle Ages, as it is even today when these are manufactured, is soot. In fact, it's commonly called lamp black. Now, the soot, you want to collect the soot and, and from a variety of methods, but one of the common, most common ways is to do what's called smoting. And traditional Chinese black ink, the soot comes from charred pine tree roots. And you want to burn something that's very oily and resinous so you can get that, that dark richness you get, so you can get a lot of smoke. Today, most of the ink sticks are made from burning tongue oil because that comes from the tongue tree, which is also very resinous. And you do that in a very traditional way. And here's a picture of a contemporary artist doing or a manufacturer smoting the tongue oil. You can see the oil down here in the bowl. It has a wick tossed into it and they let it burn. They cover that with these porcelain cups or you know, collectors and the smoke comes up in here and it collects in this, as the smoke particles rise, it hits that cooler porcelain piece and it becomes soot. You brush that off and you collect that pile. And look at the statistic over here. You don't get much soot after an entire day's burning of 120 lamps. And think of how much soot you need to going to collect to make one four inch stick of ink. It's quite a bit. So you have this pile of powder, you need to thicken it into a paste. And so once again, you're going to add your thickener or your glue. Common recipes use gum arabic, but many of them also use bone glue. And bone glue comes from the hides and bones of horses and cows. And you dry that, and then of course you dissolve that in water. You mix that together and you get really a bread dough-like texture. And you can see here, this manufacturer, this artisan is pounding that texture, that, that mixture of gum and soot and it's very dough-like and they knead it. And then you take off a little bit of a pinch of it and you can see how, how soft it looks here, almost like Play-Doh or bread dough. And that allows you now to shape it and to put it into your mold. And they mold those by pounding them in the variety of shapes you can see on the right over here. And then once that's molded and ready to go and trimmed, it has to be air dried. You don't want to bake it because that will cause cracking and you and will also make it brittle when you start to use the ink. And they let it air dry depending upon the size of the ink stick for up to two years. And you can see here, they have them on shelves, but also they hang them in little linen bags from the ceiling. And when that is finished, you have a perfect stick of ink that is ready to use tomorrow, or it can be used in 500 or 600 years from now because it's very stable. The recipe includes about 10 parts of soot to six parts of this glue. And then they also glaze it with that glue on the outside so that the carbon doesn't rub off on your hands because you need to use your hands to make it work. You take that ink stick in your hand, add a little bit of water to your grinding stone and you start to grind. The grinding breaks down the soot and the glue, or rehydrates the glue and anything else that was in there. Sometimes there's a little bit of egg white in there and sometimes there's even honey in some of these inks, old ink recipes. And you start to mix this and the ink and the water will tell you when it's the perfect viscosity. It starts to become slimy. 
And as a skilled calligrapher, you know when it's going to be the perfect thickness for your pen. Now, the ink sticks for the St. John's Bible were made in the exact same way. They were made in the 1800s in China. Donald Jackson bought the ink sticks from a company in London, in Camden Town, London, and the company is now closed from Robertson's. And he would go there and shop there in the 1960s and 70s. And that's when he bought these ink sticks because the ink sticks were brought over in the 1800s on sailing ships in shipments of tea from China. And this company, Robertson's, still had this supply of ink sticks. And Do Donald Jackson bought them over the, over the years. He bought about 144 of them for about two shillings a piece or about 12 cents each. And he wanted to use these ink sticks in the making of the St. John's Bible, but he soon discovered because he had given them away as gifts or had given them to fellow calligraphers to use, that he ended up not having enough of these. So he went to see if he could find some more and discovered it would, is impossible to buy them because they were very valuable collector's items. They were selling for an unbelievable amount of money. So he was disappointed that he couldn't use this ink for the St. John's Bible. Well, one of his colleagues, Sally Mae Joseph, was giving a lecture to some fellow calligraphers and one of them in the back, when Sally mentioned that they wanted to use these inks and didn't have enough, one of them in the back said, you know what, Donald gave me those inks several years ago. I put them in a drawer. I've not used them. I will give them back. A couple of other people with whom Donald had given these ink sticks as presents said, you know what, I've never used them either. I'll send mine back as well. And Donald ended up having enough sticks of this beautiful Chinese 1800s black carbon-based ink to write the entire St. John's Bible. The red sticks of ink used in like the kites or the footnotes for the St. John's Bible were also made in the late 1800s. In fact, the company that made the vermilion sticks that you see in front of you closed down in 1867. And they are beautifully crafted sticks of ink. Vermilion is made when you take mercuric sulfate, so not you don't want, to, don't want to lick that. And you mix it with egg white and gum arabic and other sometimes with other ingredients like honey in there as well. And you have this solid stick of ink and use it in the same way as the black stick. Now the shopkeeper that owned, that had these ink sticks from the 1800s was kind of stingy with them and he was afraid of running out of them. So he was very wary of selling them. And Donald Jackson would go in there in the 60s and 70s and buy one stick of ink or maybe two, try to get him to sell, or he'd send his friends in to buy one or two at a time as well. Not enough to create the guy, a panic in the guy and think there's a rush on them. And over time, Donald got a few of them, but when the shop owner decided to shut down, Donald went and tried to buy all of them that he had and the shop owner refused to sell them. So when everything was closed down and the older gentleman was gone, Donald researched them and actually found the supply of inks, these brilliant ink sticks, and discovered the man had a hoard of over 2,000 of them. And Donald Jackson was able to buy all the, of them, the entire supply, for literally pennies apiece. So he ended up getting them in the end. And they are truly beautiful little works of art in themselves. They are actually wrapped in their original papers from the 1800s. And when you open them, they are just exquisite. Well, no matter how exquisite your tools are, no matter how wonderful your materials are, it still takes a very talented scribe to bring those materials to life on the page. You can learn more about the St. John's Bible by visiting our website. And if you wish to learn more about the preservation work that Himmel does on manuscripts around the world, please visit our website and consider becoming one of our donors. Thank you.